All right, Alexi. Well, welcome to the show. I am so happy to have you here. You are such an inspiration and you know, I can't wait. We'll talk a little bit about your book coming out, but I can't wait to get my hands on it. Um, and I really just want to start with, you know, if you can just tell your story and what it's like, you know, to be on the path to becoming an Olympic athlete and finally achieving that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, okay. Telling my story. So for those people who don't know, I'm a long distance runner and I think, you know, my Olympic dream was more circuitous than I think people might imagine. And I think that's probably the case for a lot of Olympians where you on the outside, it might seem like this, you know, straight narrative, you know, a straight line, but it's really, uh, I think it's almost always more uh, labyrinthian for people than, than the, than it might seem. And so for me, I think it really started when I was, you know, really young. I, I lost my mom young. I lost my mom when I was four and she took her own life. And I think what that made me feel just not understanding, you know, mental health. I just, I didn't really understand was that I felt like I didn't matter enough for her to stay. And that, you know, that really motivated me, I think in my life to chase pinnacles that made me feel like I mattered. And one of those was an Olympic dream. There were other dreams. And I think I would learn eventually that it's not sustainable, you know, to be driven by an external achievement and that those like internal problems are really something that are separate from, you know, the dreams we're chasing. However, it did take me very, very far. And so, you know, I grew up with just with my dad as a single parent and my brother who is four years older in California and became, you know, a, an athlete and also a writer and, and enjoyed acting and improv theater and just try to do things, you know, at a high level. And that was like fun. But I think what I, what I learned after the Olympics was that, you know, I needed to feel like I, I am enough without these achievements and that these achievements are great and I can chase big dreams, but I am enough as, as just being myself. And so I don't know if that's, that's quite the, the nutshell of like my, my life, but, but that's sort of like the, the lessons that I've taken and, and learned eventually, you know? Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's amazing. And I'm sure you are not the only athlete who feels the same way or person in general. And I can't imagine, which I want to hear from you, but, you know, not only the mental pressures that obviously you put on yourself to be such a high achiever, but also the physical demands of long distance running and training to be able to get to that level. So how, how would you handle the pressure? And even if it was, you handled it one way before and now you handle it differently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think that like the biggest shift that I've made that has helped so much is to try to see all the dreams I'm chasing and all the commitments that I've made as like a choice rather than a sacrifice. And I think that basic like vocabulary shift is really powerful because I think inherent in the word sacrifice is like a sense of like bitterness or it just doesn't feel very positive. And I think the word choice is it's true. I've chosen to, to chase these, these many dreams and to live this kind of life. And so I think that was a big shift for me. Um, and also I think finding mentors in all the world and all the, you know, things I'm chasing and finding, seeking out mentorship, like almost like a fisherman, like I'm looking for it, I'm waiting, but I'm also going after it. And I think that's something that we can lose that mentor seeking muscle after a certain point in our life, or we can feel like, okay, I'm a grown up now. Like I don't need to like have mentors anymore. And I think that's a muscle that because I lost my mom young, I felt like I needed so many like other resources and I sought them out pretty shamelessly. And I think I just have exercised that muscle enough that I still seek out mentorship and it's helped me chase these various dreams because, uh, I have like North stars that I'm, 
I'm, you know, admiring and imitating basically, you know? Yeah, no, I love the North star analogy. Um, and I know this may be hard because you said you've had so many mentors along the way, but if there were a few really valuable lessons that you learned from those mentors that stuck out, um, are there any that you can share? Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. Well, okay. I feel like the best advice that I've ever gotten in my life was from my Olympic coach and it came before, shortly before the Olympics, I was doing, um, a workout and it, that's like, you know, you warm up and then you're trying to hit these certain times for certain intervals on the track and you have these goal times. And I was just not hitting those times. And it was pretty, it was close to the Olympics and I was nervous about, you know, my fitness and was I ready? And he was like, okay, Lex, it's okay. This is, this is the rule of thirds. And I was like, what, what's the rule of thirds? And he was, he was an Olympian himself. So like anything he said, you know, I really trusted and I really like, you know, admired him. And he said, the rule of thirds is that whenever you're chasing a dream or something hard, you are supposed to feel good a third of the time, okay, a third of the time, and crappy a third of the time. And he was like, if you're roughly falling in those ratios, then you're doing just, you're doing great. And he was like, today's a crappy day and that's totally fine. And what that helped, it was so life-changing for me because it meant that this day when I wasn't quite hitting my splits, was a part of a bigger process. And it meant that I was like exactly where I was meant to be. However, if the ratio was off, meaning if I was feeling too crappy, like all the time or too good all the time, that that's a sign. Like if you're too, if you feel amazing all the time, then you might not be pushing yourself hard enough, like whether it's athletically or otherwise, but, and if you feel too crappy all the time, you might be fatiguing, you know, or otherwise, uh, not being sustainable. And so I I think that that like rule of thirds was like some of the, probably the best advice I've ever gotten, you know? Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, honestly, I'm going to use that. I think that's great because yeah, we can't, we can't expect to feel good all the time. Um, or even just like, you know, just feeling okay some days, like you said, and then, yeah, there are going to be those crappy days, but knowing that that's all, part of, like you said, the bigger picture makes you feel better about it. Um, so even for, you know, we were talking about like the mental demands and the physical demands, how, how, and what do you do most days just to feel, you know, to have that, that third of the good and okay. Like what do you do to actually make you feel good most days? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question because I think there are like, I love because inherent in your question is like action. And I think that it's all pretty action oriented. Um, and that, you know, if we focus too much on trying to force our feelings, we just will find that we can't, but we can focus on our actions. And so the things that I do are, I mean, it's so practical, but like I try to set up as much as I can the night before And I say this thing, I say this thing, which is tomorrow starts tonight. And I really mean it that like the more we can lay out our clothes the night before, just know that there's like food in the fridge for when we're starved after training, you know, we can get it. And, and, you know, even, I mean, this is true. Like with your, with, with my supplements, it's like, I'm, I know that that is helping me for my tomorrow self. Cause I know that those are there and like, it's just setting up things so that my willpower the next day can be maximized. And, um, I recognize that willpower is like a real and depletable resource. And I think that is so important to accept because like, it's easy to, to see it, to not understand, not feel like our feeling drained at the end of the day or having decision fatigue or this and that is like a real thing, but it is. And we can set ourselves up for, having the most willpower left if we just control the things we can control. Um, Cause there's going to be stuff we can't. So I lay out my clothes the night before I know that there's fuel for like breakfast, lunch, probably dinner, you know, whether it's like defrosting something or actually cooking something ahead of time. Uh, and then I just, to the best of my ability, know where and what I'm doing the next day and things will shift. I'll feel 
you know, maybe I'm more tired or more energetic than I thought I would be, but at least I've done what I can. Um, and then all with that mindset of like, okay, this is all a choice. So if it's a super busy day, I try to approach it with like some joie de vie, you know, like that. It's mm-hmm. like, wow, this is like, this is like an amazing cauldron overflowing with bubbles. You know, it's just like, it's an amazing thing, not like a burdensome thing, you know? Yeah, no, that's great. And I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, and I want to give them a glimpse into what, you know, with how much you're training, Alexi, what do you, what are those things you're preparing? Like, what do you eat typically in a day? I know it can change. And sometimes I actually don't like the what I eat in a day because people can fixate on it and think that's yeah. exactly what they have to eat. But um, just to give them, you know, a few examples of things that really are there to fuel your body. Um, yeah. So you can make it through your training. And like we were talking about, just feel good. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like many people, I enjoy some caffeine in the morning. Um, I, you know, it's either coffee or matcha or both. And there's this coffee that I found called I'm stamina coffee and it has like mushrooms infused in it. And I have, you know, it, it, I enjoy that. So I like, and I like that I'm like harvest harnessing, like the power of the earth by like having some mushrooms in there. And and I think that this will speak to like the bigger themes of how I eat, which is that I enjoy feeling like, um, like emotionally fueled by the things that I'm eating. And I think you can feel more sustained or more like nourished if you're finding your food. Um, I mean, I am lucky. I live in LA. I can go to a farmer's market every week and eat seasonally. So like, I like discovering foods. And that was actually one of the hardest things about living. I lived in Mammoth before, and there was one grocery store there at the time and it never had any surprises. So there was no discovery. And I actually found that I did not like that. I didn't like that. I had to plan what I wanted at every trip to the grocery store because I knew it would always be there. I prefer to like be adventurous and to have a sense of like, challenge where, okay, I found this like sun choke at this farmer's market. I don't know how to cook it, but I'm going to figure it out. And I have one week to do it because then the market's happening again. And so like, I like that. And I think, um, so whatever, more practically breakfast, you know, it's like, it's oatmeal, but like with things mixed in, like I discovered blue spirulina recently. I enjoy collagen in my oatmeal. And so it's never just oatmeal or just toast, but it's some variation on those things. Um, and then lunch is usually a really big meal because it's after training. And I either really enjoy like preparing something that's like cooking while I'm training, whether there's like Greek potatoes in the oven roasting, which I'll cook in bone broth or it's leftovers that I'm going to repurpose into some sort of egg dish. Um, but lunch is like a big one. And then dinner, you know, it just, I, like, I, I, I don't have anything I don't eat. So there's no like, like things I don't eat, but it's always some kind of like protein. I enjoy vegetables, carb carbs. My favorite carb right now is black rice, like forbidden rice cooked in, coconut but I cook it in coconut milk and bone broth and it's like incredible because it has this like unctuousness and like it's so good it's so good so like I like to make things as like nourishing as they can be and I feel that when I'm eating it you know yeah wait so I gotta ask about this I love black rice so do you do half bone broth half coconut milk yeah and you can cook it in like You can do it on the on the stove. You could do it in a pressure cooker, like an instant pot, if you prefer that. And then, so my husband does not like fruit, but one addition you can make if you do like fruit is like the ma- putting mango chunks in it. People, you know, it's like a mango Ooh. coconut rice. That's very good. But this this black rice or the forbidden rice recipe has been um, man. It just has this like it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Oh my God, that sounds so good. And I love, Alexi, what you're talking about, finding surprises at the grocery store. And like you were saying as well, not everyone, unfortunately, can go to a farmer's market all year long or has access to it. But in California, 
we fortunately do. Um, but I'm always trying to encourage people to try new vegetables that they haven't tried or cook them different ways. If there's vegetable they claim they don't like, because the more variety we can get in, that's also going to give you more nutrients, which is going to help support your workouts. But then also again, just right. Like getting back to just feeling good. So I love that you're constantly like changing the foods you're eating. Um, because I found working with athletes, sometimes people can get very regimented with eating the same things at every meal, but we often forget like we need a variety of nutrients to really help support as well. Yeah. And here's a, here's a comparison, which is that I think preparing, like thinking too far in advance about what you're going to eat is almost like thinking too far in advance about what you are going to achieve in life because, okay, think about it this way. First of all, I like, if I were to try to decide what I'm going to eat like tomorrow for lunch or maybe in like three days for lunch, I don't think that would be respecting that. Like maybe in three days, my body's going to like really be craving a certain, I don't know, pro profile that answers to like a deeper need for like salt or carbs or something like that. And so I think with, with, with nutrition, not planning too far in advance is important. Um, of course, if you're looking forward to like that roasted lamb leg on Friday, like great, but like planning to a T I think will ultimately lead you deficient of things you might actually need. And with dream chasing, I think it's similar where like, I've never planned my life more than a year in advance, because I think if I had, like, if I had been like in five years, I will achieve this. Um, I think I would have limited myself. I would have like decided that X, Y, or Z was maybe not possible. And so I've tried to not plan too far in advance. Like maybe I'll think about like a feeling I want to have in five years, but not a specific goal because I've always outgrown myself. And I think we do that as humans. Like we don't know what we're quite capable of. And if we don't put that ceiling on in the first place, we're going to allow ourselves to, to grow more. So maybe it's similar with food and and dreams. (laughs) Yeah, no, I love that. Did you find when Alexi, did you decide or have the dream of going to the Olympics? Was it a really long-term goal or a shorter term goal? So my dad brought me to the 96 Olympics. I was six years old and I watched somebody run the marathon who later became my coach in college. I of course didn't know it at the time, but Mark Coogan, he ran the marathon in Atlanta. And that was just so, it was cool when that came full circle. And I think at that point that was, you know, I came home with a Barbie doll that was one of the gymnasts. And I think like an Olympic dream was born, but I didn't, I wasn't like able to have that be like a real, real dream until that very coach Mark was my coach in college. And he said, Hey, I think you can like take this dream more seriously. And I think sometimes it can help to have someone believe in us. Like hopefully we don't need it, but it certainly can help. And so I think for me, it was like a ticklish dream when I was little, but I, I think I took it more seriously and really began chasing it in the middle towards the end of college, to be honest. That's awesome. Yeah. It's so great when you like re you know, when the universe kind of reconnects you with people like that. Have Um, you had that happen to you? I mean, I feel like it's funny. My husband would say, I talk about the universe way too much. And, you know, I would say little things just, I would say, I feel like at least once a week, there's something small that I can often get ahead of myself as well. And, want things to be perfect and lined up a specific way. And then I swear the universe always brings me back to the timing that's meant to be. Yeah. Um, so I, I will say I feel that a lot and I just love hearing people's stories where they are reconnected with people or, um, they realize all the timing they had planned out or wanted to play, have planned out. It actually worked out better the way it did. Well, that's, that just speaks to your inclination towards feeling like the universe and the world is like in your favor, which I think is a choice you've made, you know, like I think somebody might see the same circumstances in the opposite way and that you've just chosen to see your world as like conspiring for you, which is such a a good choice, right? 
Oh, totally. I don't know Alexi. Do you know Gabby Bernstein at all? I know who that is, but not like... So she has, if anyone's interested in kind of what Alexi and I are talking about right now, she has a book called The Universe Has Your Back, and she promotes a lot of it. But I just love, she has great meditations, manifestations, but um, she really does promote just, you know, if you're in a spot and feeling like things are going wrong or not going the way you had planned to try and really let go and trust that the universe has your back. And oftentimes, I mean, I've Mm. seen it through friends, family members, my own experiences that, you know, things do work out. There can be lots of hard times before you get there, which I'm sure you've experienced too. get you know, on your many goals that you've set for yourself. Um, but yeah, no, I love that. And, um, really just trusting in yourself, which I'm sure you've had to do a lot because I'm sure there's been ups and downs throughout and you haven't, you know, I'm sure not every time you reached the time you wanted or the goal you set. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's interesting you say the, like the, the letting go element, because then we have this question of like, so when, what amount do we like forge forward and like pivot and keep creating inevitability about our goal and when do we like let go or see what's coming back at us almost like we're hitting a tennis ball and we're waiting for it to come back and see where what it, where it's coming back so i think that's like a really delicate difficult balance right to understand like how much like agency are we supposed to have in like making it inevitable or not whatever it is um I'm not, I'm not saying I have an answer. I'm just saying like, that's the question we have to ask if we have that worldview of like the universe will make it happen. It's like, well, it'll make it happen, but we still have to like encourage the positive winds or like, we still have to like keep the energy going. Like, so there's like, there's give and take with that. Right. Mm-hmm. And like you said earlier, still taking those actionable steps that you can do every day to make you feel good. Right. So it's not just, Oh, trust the universe and everything will be fine. And you know, you can lay around all day and not do things that are supporting yourself and making you feel good. It's, you need to do those things. Um, you know, one, like we're saying just to feel good each day, but to support all of that as well. Um, I mean, we could go on and on Alexi talking about the (laughs) the universe having your back, but I, you know, it's, I, I, it's, it's important. And, um, one of the things I was thinking about too, was I can't imagine throughout the years how much time you've spent training, right? Like, you know, I don't think people realize the amount of time people who get to the Olympics actually have to train every day. And I'm so curious, how has that affected like other areas of your life, your relationships, your socialization, especially growing up too, because I'm sure as a kid, you were training a lot as well and in college. And so how, how, yeah, how was every other area of your life affected by it? Yeah. Well, so it's interesting because, so I've played a lot of sports growing up and even up through high school, I was like a very competitive soccer player. Um, and I made the choice to pursue running, partly because it is a very social sport. Like I'm, I'm serious that like, it was such a, like when I, cause we have to wrap our heads around what is it going to look like every day of chasing our dreams, not just like getting to the dream. And thankfully with running, I felt like, okay, if I like the girls, the women that I'm training with enough, I'm probably going to really enjoy the time that I'm spending with them. And it's going to feel like more than just the physical output and input, it's going to feel like a mental support and good thing. And that was true. Like in college, you know, there are hard workouts where you simply can't talk and that's like, but you're, you're still bonding to be honest when you're working hard together, but so much of running is, is just getting in a lot of miles and you can do that with company. And so I think I made partly made the choice towards running because I could see myself doing it every day and not, not like getting exhausted mentally by it and even growing by the social aspect of it. I think that's one thing. Um, I'm sure other sports are social too, but running is very, very social. If you find people who can 
be on your, you know, be doing it with you. Um, but now, you know, in adulthood, I'm married, I live in LA and training is certainly one of those things that like, look, like there's a time and a place when I can stay up late at the movie premiere and there's a time and a place when I can't. And I think that, you know, for me, it's been important to just really commit to whatever moment that I'm in, which means when I'm preparing for a race, I'm not staying, I'm in bed by nine, you know, but when the race is over and we're like going to South by Southwest with our movie, I'm up, I'm out until 3 a.m. for that brief, you know, few days of movie premiere and I'm in a gown and I'm really like embracing that. And so I think it is just important for me to know that there's a time and a place for everything and that the time will come. So like these periods of focus um, are not indefinite. And I think for anyone, it's just important to like set small boundaries where you will check, check in and out of one lifestyle. Right. So there's these like cycles and we're, we're used to it growing up. We get like semesters in school and then there's summer break. And I think after school is over, we must build those, those barriers in for ourselves so that we know that this is not forever. And it can exist within a day too, right? Like if you really commit to your craft when you're doing it, like, you know, if I'm training, I'm like, I'm in it for those 90 minutes, I'm really, I'm running. Then you can also commit to the transition out where the rest of the day I'm going to be working on my book or I'm going to nap or whatever. And that has actually kept me healthy too, because some runners I've noticed whether they're running 24 hours a day, like they're not, but they're, they're thinking about running 24 hours a day. So I think there's something healthy about shifting, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. And do you, do you find that, helps prevent you from burning out or do do you get burned out a lot Alexi and you're you know yeah you need to take a little break or what do you do in those times if you get burnt out to kind of yeah. bring you back to life and bring you back into it yeah so definitely i would say the difference between like for me if i were running like 60 50 or 60 miles a week i probably wouldn't burn out but i'm running like 100 to 120 miles a week at like these peak training times and that feels like work. Like that is definitely not every mile is not like joyous. It's a lot of miles, so many miles. And so I think I do one of two things. One, I will scale it back, like skip a double run and let's not and say we did and understand that like my cells only know effort. And if I feel that I've given the effort that day or in that week, then like giving myself the grace of like, adjusting and two, knowing what rebuilds my willpower, which for me, I mentioned before is like cooking is one of those things that I really enjoy. And there's other things that are uniquely restorative to me. And I think a big thing has been figuring out what, what are those things? Because some people might find cooking to be like a draining burden. And so I just have learned what makes me feel like I'm restoring myself and then doing it, like just doing it when I need to do it because I know like I, you know, and then recognizing the signs, like if I'm not sleeping at night because of anxiety, that's like a big red flag, you know? So I need to stop. Okay. So that's really interesting, Alexi. I'm glad you brought up sleep because I think that's something people often overlook when it comes to their health routine or regimen or not realizing that if you're not sleeping well, nothing else is really going to work well or feel good. So what have you noticed with your sleep and just how you feel and how you train? For me, I don't know if this is like a a blessing or a curse, but sleep is the most important thing to me. Like it truly will, um, I try like, okay, if I have not gotten a lot of sleep, but I'm still like energized and happy for some reason, I will accept that. And I've learned that with, I work with a sports psychologist and she was like, you know, 
energy is elastic. So like there are going to be nights when like you don't sleep a lot, but somehow you can do amazing things. And I often feel that way during film shoots where like you sleep very little, but you're so like happy. Like it's just such a, so I accept my true, like what I feel in a moment, but I also know that I need as much sleep as I can possibly get. And it solves everything like from, you know, it, I, I can, I, I just, I need sleep and I try to do my best to set up myself for that sleep success, which means going to bed as early as I can so that I possibly might not wake up to an alarm. Like I wake up before the alarm. I wake up naturally. That's the best thing. I do magnesium like before bed and I'm learning now that there are different kinds of magnesium and I didn't realize that. So I think that I've adjusted to taking the magnesium supplements, which has the actual recovery benefits that your body can absorb. Um, and then, you know, eating at an hour where like, it's not right before bed. And then I'm trying to also improve my computer and phone hygiene (laughs) because my, my brother was like, this has real effect. And I tried to do that. And it does like to, to put the screens away is really important. Yeah. I mean, I will say, Alexi, if you're, you know, I would say my husband, I probably watch, you know, a movie or a show before bed most nights. And I have personally found that wearing blue light glasses during that duration, if I don't have them, like we're on vacation and I haven't brought them, I notice a big change in how tired I am. So if you need another support tool for your screen time, um, I have found it's really helped me. That's awesome. I. I've heard of that and I think so are yours prescription or are they just like this the blue no light just protection? the just the blue light protection glasses so you and you know you want to get them from like a, a reputable company and obviously read the reviews because I have heard that some are, are a little scammy but I definitely notice a difference like I'm way more tired and ready for bed like I can I can feel my melatonin levels increasing mm-hmm. when I wear them versus the times when I don't I can easily stay up way later. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if you, if you need another another tool, because sometimes it can be hard to limit that screen time, or you know, even turning up the warmness can help. But just another. That's helpful. Yeah. yeah. So I want to shift a little bit, Alexi, and you know, tell me your comfort level too. But I know you speak a lot about it in your book. Um really training your mental health as much as your physical health. And if you could just tell us a little bit about your journey after the Olympics and after reaching, you know, your goal that you had had for so many years, um, since going to that race too, with your dad, when you were little and how, how you train your mental health. Yeah. So I think it's great to just start there with like, you can train it and like, it is a muscle. And I learned that in college and that was from more a performance side where the same coach actually was like, we got to work on our mental health or mental strength. And, um, I think, so I think my first introduction to it was like, you know, building it from a performance side, visualizing myself achieving, you know, getting up a hill, that I knew was happening in a race before the race. So that when I approached that hill and the race in the race, I had already seen myself conquer it. So that was like one side of it. But after the Olympics was a whole other side where, you know, I really didn't, I think respect that there was such an adrenal fatigue associated with the moment after you achieve a dream like that, like an Olympic dream or any big moment in your life. And I had this feeling of, wanting to know what was next, like what was my next goal and chasing it immediately. And I didn't have great advice otherwise. And so I just like basically pressed on and was like, what's the next thing? And and did not respect the, the moment afterwards as a real like chapter of that, that, that same dream. Like it's, there's a epilogue right to every dream and I just didn't want to have it and I didn't understand. And so I didn't respect the the moment afterwards. And what I've learned is that there is a moment afterwards. So anytime we 
have a big, big moment, whether it's like an Olympic dream, releasing the book. I've heard that people experience this when they give birth, you know, that there's like, there's time afterwards where we might want to respect the, the, that moment. And so what I've learned to do is to understand that that's normal and natural that like, no matter how well, like I, I broke a record at the Olympics. It was incredible. I loved it, but I still had that feeling afterwards and I didn't understand to pause. And so now I've tried to pause and also recognize the signs of like, that might lead to depression, which for me were, I stopped sleeping because I had a lot of anxiety about what was next. And I made a lot of shifts in my life. I switched coaches. I switched events. I moved. Um, there was a lot going on and I didn't really respect that. Maybe that was too much to put on my plate right after the Olympics. Um, and so now I, I guess I train my mind by respecting that when something little creeps up, like I have a bad night of sleep and and there's some anxiety to address it immediately and to try to understand why, what was keeping me up at night? Like what was, what was that thing? Because before I didn't see any of the red flags as red flags. I just thought that I needed to press through them. And now I recognize that like I can prevent, you know, another dip and another, another big dip by respecting the little signs that my body's giving me. Um, and there's actually a really practical bit of advice that I was given by a physio that I could share that I think is really cool. It's really, really cool. So, um, I was experiencing like a year or two ago, some like hip pain and it felt like I was like, is my hip broken? And like, it wasn't broken, but like I had this really weird pain and my physio was like, okay, it's going to be fine. It's a nervous system, you know, overload. But he was like, tell me about earlier this week. Did you notice anything on your face? And I was like, my face, like, this is my hip though. And he was like, yeah, but what about your face? (laughs) And, um, I realized that I'd had this like red splotch on my face. That was unusual. Like I'm a, I'm a Greek woman. I have olive skin and this was very unusual. And he was like, okay, so when in the future, when you notice something is off on your face, he's like, I want you to respect it because you have the most nerves on your face, your hands and your stomach. And that's why when we're nervous, we feel weird in our stomach. Um, and he said that our bodies are always rooting for us. So basically if we are experiencing like a little bit of adrenal o- overload, our body tries to send it to our places where we have the most nerves first. And so now I've started to pay attention to like, if I get a pimple, which for me is unusual if, or if someone gets a canker sore or something weird on their face, that it's just a sign that something's a little overloaded and we can pause right there and then prevent it from escalating to an actual injury or an actual depression, you know? And so I think that's just such a cool tool. And it also means that our bodies are really trying to help us. Yeah, no, I love that. And that is such a good practical piece of advice because that's something everyone, I mean, we're looking at our face every day. We're looking at our hand, like, but it's actually paying attention, like you said, to those warning signs and not just letting them go, even if it's sleep, right? Noticing I'm really having trouble sleeping um, and taking care of it and reaching out to someone for help, which I'm curious, Alexi, how was it for you just getting the courage to ask for help when you realized something was wrong and you didn't feel good mentally? Yeah, well, um, I did not want to get help at that time because I just didn't understand, like, oops, I did not understand my brain was like a body part. I just like, I didn't understand. And it was actually my dad that made me get help. And I'm really grateful that he did. And then once I did have that, I had an appointment. Um, I actually met several people cause I think it's good to find someone you connect with. Um, and the one that I did connect with explained to me quite simply that my brain was a body or well, he said, you have, you are sick and you have like a scratch on your brain. And it's like when you fall down and you get a scratch on your knee, except this is on your brain. And I think like for me, that took away all the shame because nobody's ashamed when they like break their leg or like cut their elbow. It's just like you are injured and you know that you'll heal, you know, it'll take time, you know, you can do things to help it. 
And I started to think about my mental health in the same way. And it was just magical how much it shifted things from feeling like it was my fault, my responsibility, and that I was really spoiled for feeling this way to something that was just pretty ob- objective and sim- a little simpler and solvable, you know? Yeah, no, I I think just the fact that you said <sighs> the opportunity to heal it. Oh, I feel like oftentimes people don't you know, if we hear depression or anyone who's going through any type of um, mental health issue, there's not that much talk about the healing aspect of it. There's a lot about Mm -hmm. prevention, which is great and everyone should focus on, but that no, you can heal it. It's not like once you have it, you have it, right? And I love, I I actually had read, um, that on your New York Times article. And I had written it down here because it was so powerful. And I really hope everyone listening really responds to that and, you know, shares it with their family, their friends, because looking at it as something you can heal. And I know you had compared it, Alexi, I think in the article to like, if you got a hamstring injury, Mm -hmm. what would you do? You would train to heal it, right? And recover to heal it. So I think, and I wish that was spoken about more so when we talk about mental health. So I love that you're bringing that to the forefront. Um, And there was something else you said in that article that I loved as well was in terms of your mindset, and I'm curious to what your mindset is now after going through all that, but you had said, I don't expect to be happy every day. And it kind of goes back to, I feel like, your rule of thirds that you were yeah. taught by your mentor. But can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it does go back to the rule of thirds where there's going to be like discomfort and pain in our lives just without us even chasing it, you know? And that is normal and it is it can be perceived as like a threat, but we can shift to try to see it as more of like a sensation, I think, and just have a different relationship with pain. Of course, like injury pain is different than like the pain of pushing through a race when you're healthy or heartbreak or other kinds of pain. Um, But when it's like good pain, meaning, you know, of the healthy variety, I think it, um, it's it's something that we can come to expect and have a different approach to and not be so like offended by it because we already know that it's going to be a part of our journey like it's just it is and we can even relish in it if we see it as a part of dream chasing which by the rule of thirds it is no that's great i love it well you know this has been so good alexi just in terms of you know being inspirational, but also being very real and raw, which I really appreciate and want to thank you for. Um, But I want to give you a chance to now to tell people where can they follow you for more inspiration? Where can they get your book? um, Mm. And where can they connect with you if maybe they're going through similar feelings or they are training currently to be an Olympic athlete or want to be? um, Where can they find you? Yes. Well, thankfully, we made an Ask Bravey series with Nordic Naturals. Um, and that was, I get a lot of like questions on email and Instagram. And we tried to answer some of the like big, big thematic ones. And so that Ask Bravey series is on YouTube. And I, and it also lives on the, on my website and the Bravey book website. And that my website's just my name, alexipappas.com. My social media is just my name as well. So I'm pretty easy to find. Um, And the book is called Bravey. And I see it behind you. Yeah. behind me. Show us. (laughs) Chasing dreams, befriending pain and other big ideas with a forward by Maya Rudolph. And it's available anywhere you buy books. So really like your local bookstore, Amazon, wherever you like to get your books. And I think, uh, you know, I hope it helps give not only inspiration, but also, um, also 
like tools and empowerment to do whatever you want to do. Do your, do your, you know, to manifest the greatest version of yourself. Well, I'm sure it does because you've already given us so many tools just on this podcast. Um, So how we like to end each show is a little rapid fire Mm Q&A. So just first thing that comes to mind, you can elaborate if you want, but first one is going to be favorite home cooked meal. Oh man. Okay. Well, (laughs) the Greek potatoes, which are potatoes quartered and cooked in a combination of bone broth, olive oil, and lemon juice. And Mm -hmm. you can put as many herbs in as you want. Uh, And because we're on the potato theme, I suppose I'd probably try to roast like a leg of lamb with it, which is just really the best thing ever. Um, And I've been really into salads with miso dressing and pomegranate seeds these days. And my black rice, the forbidden rice recipe that I gave you earlier. So there's a hearty meal. Oh my gosh, that sounds still. I'm I'm getting hungry now. Um, okay, favorite de-stressing practice or support tool. My favorite de-stressing tool is either cooking something, even if it's like an experimental, trying to use things in my cabinet project, or watching a food-related show while like rolling around on the ground like stretching or whatever. (laughs) Love that. Um, Okay. Well, and I know you said earlier, we kind of talked, but coffee or tea, if you had to choose one. Coffee. Okay. Awesome. And what are you, tell me a little bit more about your coffee, Lexi. Do you put anything in it? What's your coffee like? Yeah. So I really like the um, I'm stamina coffee, which has the mushrooms infused in it. And I add like, milk, some sort of like alternative milk usually, but I'll drink cream. I'm not like dairy free or anything. Uh, and sometimes I'll turn it into like a coffee milkshake where I'll put the like cold leftover coffee in the blender with like a banana milk, um, you know, sweetener if I want, and I'll make like a milkshake. Oh my God. That sounds delicious. I'm like ready for lunch and dessert right now. Yes. And whipped cream. Oh, I've been really into coconut whipped cream on top of all. It's just like a really like it's like adding, you know, sprinkles to a cake where you're like, you don't need it, but you do. Oh, yeah. And are you, Alexi, are you like, will you just make it from the can or do you buy like the? Because I now they have like canned coconut whip. I buy it, but it's only because I don't have one of those kitchen aids like I can't make yeah. it. I mean, I could hand whip, but I am not that dedicated to this. <laughs> so some someday I'll make it myself. I would like to, but I don't have the tools right now. Yeah, no, I mean, the can's always the easiest way to go. Well, thank you so much, Alexi. You know, everyone, please go check out her book, follow her on Instagram, her website. Um, you know, I really, like I said, this is definitely, there's been nuggets in here that I will take with me for the rest of my life, like that rule of thirds. And um, yeah, I just, I wish you all the best. And I know you're still training for hopefully the Olympics whenever it happens. So I wish you all the best with that too. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 